Welcome to the London Luminaries, historic properties working collaboratively together to share our collective history. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm the host for this evening. I get the delight of welcoming you, but also to introducing our incredible chair, Professor Judith Hawley. Hello, everyone. My name is Judith Hawley and I'm uh, the chair for another in the London Luminaries lecture series. If you're new to the Luminaries, let me tell you that we represent a group of historic properties working together to explore the history of the West of London. Each property provides the talk and the Luminaries supplies a platform for them. We volunteer our time to organise, publicise and then edit the talks. We also arrange regular meetings with the Luminaries partners. If you're familiar with what we do, you might like to know that we've made some changes to our offering this year. First, I'm delighted to say that new members have joined us and the William Morris Society will be, will be presenting a talk later in the season. The second bit of news is that we've decided to space out our nine talks this year so that we'll have roughly one a month. I know there are 12 months in the year, but, but bear with me. We hope that makes it easier for you to fit them into your busy lives. And finally, if you stay to the end of the talk, you'll hear me announce our most exciting new venture. The London Luminaries are going live and in person. Now I'll introduce the speaker to you. And before he begins, I want to warn you that we've had some technical problems and uh, the sound quality isn't as good as we would like it to be. I know that the sound quality is, is important, but we've we've done our best. Um, and it's I'm so delighted that we've got our speaker, Howard Simmons, who gave an excellent talk in our, in our series on love and death last year. And Howard is a professional guide at Scion House and has also made significant contributions to the heritage of our region from Heathrow to Chiswick House. He's talking us, to us tonight on the subject of siblings, spies and civil war, how family ties led to conspiracy and betrayal at Scion House. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad you're able to join us this evening. And um, this evening, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the next period in Zion's history. Last season, we talked about uh, medieval and Tudor Zion. And this evening, we're going to move forward into Jacobean and uh, Stuart Zion and the Civil War. Really, it's a prequel just to say this is when the Perses come to Zion uh, at the end of the um, 16th century. Uh, they've had no connection with the house up until then. Uh, and I'm just going to quickly give you a, 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 an insight into the Percy panoply of power, if you like, as kings of the north, um, which is what they're known as. Percy's were a, a, a family that came across with William the Conqueror. Um, and as a military family, they were given lands to settle in this country in reward for the invasion of England in 1066. Uh, and they had lands initially in Sussex, they moved up to Lincolnshire, they moved up to Yorkshire, and eventually they took on the role of protecting the border with Scotland in Northumberland and were made Earls of Northumberland. And uh, they developed their military power and their economic power and indeed their political power, so they became known as Kings of the North. And here you can see Annick Castle, which is still today the family home of the Percys, um, this was originally started to be constructed in the 12th century, and the Perses took it on, uh, bought it initially from the Bishop of Durham, and then extended it. It is, in fact, one of the largest medieval castles, not just in Britain, but in Europe. And some people may be familiar with it from the film um, where it stood in for Hogwarts uh, uh, School. Uh, in the Harry Potter series, basically. But it gives you some idea of the power that the Perses had. This was their main stronghold. They also had a series of other fortresses, if you walk with Castle, uh, another one that the Perses uh, took, a 12th century establishment, which they expanded and built up. And they held this region with a series of military bastions across uh, England uh, and, and in the north. So hence the, the title, uh, Kings of the North. Um, a checkered history towards the end of the 16th century, however, the seventh Earl, who was a, a, a devout Catholic, became involved in supporting Mary, Queen of Scots, and was a, a main contributor to the rising in the north of the Catholic families. And this led to him being executed for treason by Elizabeth in 1572. The eighth Earl, who succeeded him, um, who'd been loyal up till then, also became involved in, uh, if you like, a conspiracy to support Mary, Queen of Scots. Uh, he did this on three separate occasions. On the third occasion, he was incarcerated in the Tower of London. And uh, when they went to check on his cell, they found him dead uh, with two bullets in his heart. 
Um, no sign of a pistol, but the official verdict was that he'd committed suicide. Um, the pamphlets at the time basically spread the story that he'd been um, assassinated by, by the English state, the English government, essentially. Uh, the ninth Earl, <laughs> who succeeded them, had been raised as a Protestant, and so forth. Therefore, things should have looked a little more promising for the Percy family. Uh, but I think Elizabeth was somewhat concerned about their loyalty and felt it best to separate the Percys from their power base in the north. She then basically um, had Zion House as a royal property and was using it for council of state. She offered it to the Percys uh, as a home which they could borrow uh, and, and lease. Um, and so you'll see uh, Algernon Percy, the, the ninth Earl, who came down to Zion, and this is when the Percys first started their, uh, their uh, occupation of Zion House. Um, Algernon married uh, Dorothy Devereux, uh, the kinswoman of, of Elizabeth, but which she was pleased. And essentially, he started his family when he came down to uh, Zion. So the siblings who are going to feature very much in the talk tonight during the Civil War period were all born here at Zion House. Uh, Henry uh, was, was known as the Wizard Earl, and uh, he's shown in this picture uh, as Chancellor of Cambridge University. So he's something of a polymath involved in uh, the sciences, music, the arts, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, he became heavily involved in brokering the succession of James VI of Scotland to become king in England as well as James I. Uh, and uh, essentially, you can see uh, the house when, uh, when uh, as, as uh, Algernon was living here, and you can actually, if you look at the front of the house, uh, you can see the two pepper pots, which he designed and had built at the front, and you can see the River Thames in the back. You can see James, essentially, uh, 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 somewhat ironic that after all those troubles during Elizabeth's reign with the Catholic plots in favour of Mary, Queen of Scots, that he should in fact be the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, who became King of England as well on Elizabeth's death. But uh, James came to Zion to see uh, Algernon and thanked him very much for the support which he'd given to him and uh, in gratitude gave him the freehold of Zion House. So from 1603, um, essentially, the Percys have owned Zion as a London home, uh, alongside Annick and all the other possessions up in, in Northumberland. Uh, so things were looking pretty good in 1603, 1604. Um, Algernon now is, is a, a man relieved of any, any uh, doubts about uh, loyalty. Um, he's in the five favour of James, the new king. It's all looking very positive until he's caught up in the gunpowder plot. Now, this is because of family involvement. Thomas Percy, his cousin, who he'd made steward of Annick Castle, um, and had also managed to have joined the gentlemen pensioners, the private guard of King James, um, had been acted as a go-between between Algernon and the king. And uh, Thomas was a, an ardent Catholic and felt that uh, James had promised to do something to improve the position of the Catholics and Catholic religion in Britain and was bitterly disappointed when James appeared very modest in, in any concerns on that front. Therefore became involved in the gunpowder plot, which as I'm sure you all know was an intention to blow up the Houses of the Parliament on the state opening of Parliament, killing the King um, and uh, therefore a major coup, a major terrorist coup, coup as it would have been in fact. Um, it didn't happen because the plotters are discovered. Uh, poor old Algernon had hosted Thomas Percy at a meal at Zion on the 4th of November and uh, suspicion immediately fell on him that he was involved and implicated in the plot. It's highly unlikely that that was the case because he was planning to be sitting in Parliament with the King uh, and would have been killed in just the same way if, if he had in fact been uh, there. So um, I think historians mostly today feel that he was not involved. It, what it basically happened is he is punished. He is incarcerated in the Tower of London for some 16 years and is only allowed to leave after paying a, a significant fine. Um, and he's therefore separated from, uh, from his young family to some degree. But his conditions in the tower are, are pretty comfortable, and he's allowed to continue with his scientific experiments and his uh, circle of intellectual friends. And he also schools his, his children. They're allowed to visit him in the tower, and particularly his uh, heir and successor uh, is, is, uh, is able to uh, go to the tower on a regular basis. So we move on to the second section of the talk, which is basically the siblings, his children who were, as I say, born here at Zion, and what, what involvement they had in the Civil War period. 
Um, passionate affairs, plots and counterplots, betrayals, and to quote the saying of the time, the world turned upside down. Just concentrating on this concept of the world turned upside down, I think it's worth just reflecting on um, the, the period of the Civil War. Uh, it was a time of huge upheaval, of social and political unrest, of economic change, of uh, religious tension. Um, it wasn't unique to, to England or to Britain. Uh, there'd been major and were continuing major wars of religion in Europe. And some historians now place the English Civil War or the British Civil Wars, plural, um, in that context. Uh, what I would want to point out before we move on is just very quickly the impact. Essentially, we have fighting across the country over 11 years. It's a very significant impact on British society. Um, you have all four British kingdoms involved. There's fighting in Ireland, there's fighting in Wales, there's fighting in Scotland, and there's fighting in England itself. So the English Civil War doesn't really do justice to the nature of that war. Um, and the point is that unlike wars that we've been involved in previously, such as the Hundred Years' War, and most of the battles were fought on the continent, or indeed the Wars of the Roses, which had extended over 30 years, but had been a series of major set-piece battles with significant peaceful periods in between. This was a period of intense warfare across the whole country. The economic impact was quite devastating. Um, essentially, something like 150 towns and uh, cities were very badly damaged in the fighting. Um, over 200 villages were completely destroyed. Something like 220 country houses were also destroyed. And as we know, as we go around today, we can see 56 medieval castles, which had stood the test of time up until then, were slighted after the Civil War and were badly damaged. 250,000 people were made homeless and were refugees. And the impact overall of the fighting, the impact of disease, the impact of starvation, meant that, the, in fact, the, the, the overall casualty rate was comparable to that of the First World War. So the impact on Britain was very significant. The colourful stories I'm going to carry through in the next few minutes should not take away from understanding just, just what an impact um, the Civil Wars had for that whole period. So here are the siblings, let's introduce them. Um, the eldest, Algernon Percy, who is the heir and will become the, uh, the 10th Earl. Um, Henry Percy, his younger brother, uh, who is the spare, and Lady Lucy, uh, uh, their sister, uh, who here uh, is called the seductress. But I want to reflect on that a little later because I do want to challenge some of the misogyny, which I think is around about um, strong and, and characterful women. Um, so let's move into looking at those in some detail. So I think we'll start with Lady Lucy. Um, this is a rather lovely painting by uh, Van Dyck, which is in the, um, in the Duke's uh, uh, collection. Um, and she's married to um, James Hay, uh, the first Earl of Carlisle, at the age of 17. Uh, she starts off as a teenager. Now, she's, um, she's, quite, a, she's quite a striking, um, striking uh, young woman, um, and she makes a real impact on court. She is taken on as uh, um, a lady of the chamber by Henrietta Maria, the queen. Initially, relationships are a little bit tense, but she soon becomes a firm favourite of Henrietta Maria and very influential in Henrietta Maria's household. Um, there are some interesting studies that have been made recently about, if you like, the, the level of political influence that uh, the Queen um, and her entourage had um, during the war and the level of connections uh, and interplay um, alongside, if you like, the court of the King uh, and, and the male domain. Uh, and, and the behaviour and attitudes of women in this, I think, are, are, are worth examining a little bit more. Henrietta Maria, of course, has married Charles at the age of 15 and comes across uh, and is very unhappy and miserable um, from France. Uh, she is the sister of uh, Louis XIII, the, um, the, the King of France, um, and uh, she's, she's Catholic, firmly Catholic. She's unpopular in this country, one, because she's foreign, she's French, and two, because she's Catholic, and she feels the sort of the you know the, the nature of that that uh, that contempt. She goes on to become a major strength to Charles. I should say initially their relationship is a bit rocky, um, because Charles is totally under the influence of the Duke of Buckingham, George Villiers. But after his assassination, Charles turns to her for comfort, 
and they become very close. I uh, have nine children, and I think she's a real emotional support to him. She's also a strong influence on him, and uh, some people argue that because of her Catholic religion and because of her own uh, solid sense of what should be done, she makes him more obstinate, more stubborn, less likely to compromise, and that actually compounds the problems within the Civil War period. Uh, just to reflect on Lady Lucy again, um, there is a contemporary poem, uh, well, by two, two of the contemporary po uh, court poets, um, and I'll just read it out because you can probably read it on the text, but essentially it's reflecting on her and her impact on others. So if we take what Thomas Carew starts by saying, didst thou not find the place inspired and flowers as if they had desired no other sun, start from their beds and for a sight steal out their heads. Hurt thou not music when she talked? Didst not find that as she walked, she threw rare perfumes all about, such as bean blossoms newly out, or chafed spices give? Alas, Tom, I am flesh and blood, and was consulting how I could, in spite of masks and hoods, descry the parts denied unto the eye. I was undoing all she wore, and had she walked but one turn more, even her first state had not been more naked or more plainly seen somewhat ribald perhaps but an interesting reflection on the way in which she was perceived uh, in court by some uh, and i think it's a rather one-dimensional perspective on her but we'll come on to that a little later now she is somewhat uh, controversial in the sense that she manages to have a number of very high level liaisons with significant and powerful men she starts with the Duke of Buckingham, um, and uh, when he's assassinated, she moves on to um, uh, Thomas Wentworth, the Earl of Stafford, both of whom are great supporters of King Charles and uh, play a major role in his uh, obstinacy in terms of negotiations with, with Parliament. Um, interestingly, she then also develops a relationship with John Pym, one of the key parliamentary leaders. And so we have this rather interesting situation where there must have been some interesting pillow talk going on uh, between strong royalists and strong uh, parliamentarians and Protestants, essentially. Um, possibly one of her most um, impactful uh, moves was to hear that the parliamentarians from John Pym were thinking of impeaching Queen Henrietta Maria because of her Catholicism and seeing her as being a troublemaker. And she told the king about this, whereupon the king decided to essentially um, move to arrest the five leading parliamentarians. And of course, she informed about this to the parliamentarian side through John Pym. Um, what this meant was when Charles moves to Parliament with an armed guard, um, he bursts into Parliament. He leaves He leaves the majority of the soldiers outside, but he does take 80 men into Parliament. And when he marches into the chamber, he actually takes uh, two armed guards with him. Um, to find that the five rebel parliamentarian leaders that he wishes to arrest have gone. They, they earlier on slipped off, took a barge down the river to the city of London where they took refuge. Um, he demanded of the Speaker of the House to tell him where they were, to which he responded, and the classic statement, I, I have not eyes to see nor tongue to speak except as this house directs me, Your Majesty. Um, as the first time, if you like, that a speaker had uh, spoken for parliamentary liberty rather than recognising a sovereign as being the person that they should directly respect. Charles basically says, uh, I see the birds have flown and, uh, and leaves. But it causes an absolute outroar in London. There is basically a huge outcry, major demonstrations, and Charles realises that he's gone a step too far. Um, this all took place on the 4th of January, 1642, and the 10th of January, he believes that London is not a safe place for him or his family anymore, and he leaves. He moves firstly to Hampton Court, and then he leaves London. Uh, many people think, uh, many historians think, that this was a major mistake because London was the key city. Um, London was the capital. 80% of trade went through London. It was a seat of government. It had the Tower of London, the major arsenal with weapons in. Uh, it, it had Parliament uh, and, and so on and so forth. And by leaving London, Charles had weakened his position very considerably. 
Um, London is also the biggest city in terms of the population. Just remembering population this time, about four and a half million for, for the British Isles. Um, and in essence, London, the biggest city, one of the biggest cities in Europe, at around about 400,000. Uh, the next biggest city, uh, Bristol, at 100,000. The next biggest city, Norwich, at 50,000. The next biggest city, York, at about 35,000. So you get some sense of, of the urban um, nature and the very rural nature of, of England um, and the importance, the dominating importance of London. By leaving London, the king has essentially made a, a, a major concession, essentially. Uh, this shows where... Um, Lucy ends up. Um, <laughs> essentially, she continues to act as an agent for the royalists. Um, she she acts on behalf of Queen Henrietta Maria in 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 connection with a number of royalist uh, cells that are operating around the country, um, and Parliament uh, effectively have her moved to the Tower as a prisoner. She spends some eighteen months there. Um, and she's threatened the torture. She isn't actually tortured, but she's threatened the torture. Uh, then she's finally released. And she then basically takes a step back from involvement in politics and, and in uh, the, um, the, the, the various uh, conspiracies that have been going on. She does continue to support the Queen. She acts as an agent between Charles, uh, the eldest son of Charles I, um, after the, after the uh, execution of King Charles I and, and Queen Henrietta Maria. And she continues uh, writing in code to a number of, of, of key royalists. Um, but as you can see, quite a colourful uh, uh, young woman who has a major impact uh, in ways that have had lasting effects, in essence. I should just comment by saying that um, you probably all know that uh, at the state opening of Parliament today, this is why we have the situation where the Black Rod comes and knocks on the door and asks permission for the Sovereign to come in to open Parliament and make the Queen's speech or King's speech um, uh, as a con direct consequence of that attempt, bungled attempt by Charles and his breach of parliamentary privilege by marching in with, with soldiers uh, with no invitation. We move on to the second of the um, siblings, and this is the younger brother of Algernon, uh, Henry. Um, uh, and Henry, uh, Henry, I would say, is is a bit more involved in inept uh, manoeuvrings. Um, he is a loyal uh, 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 supporter of uh, the royalists and of of the royal family, um, but his actions actually do much to undermine it unintentionally. Uh, Initially, uh, he is um, again uh, supported by Queen Henrietta Maria, probably through the influence of his sister, uh, and she regards him as as someone whom she recommends to the king uh, for 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 permanent. He becomes master of the horse to the Prince of Wales, um, and uh, he 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 basically holds the role of chamberlain in the household for a period of time. Um, but uh, he is involved in 1641 in what's called the Army Plot. Uh, Stafford has been uh, arrested and is, is facing impeachment and is being held at the Tower of London. And there's a conspiracy amongst a number of, uh, of officers within the royalist sector to free him from the Tower uh, before he's impeached and before uh, uh, the sentence can be served. Um, the plot is leaked um, and... Uh, the king is furious because this puts him in a very difficult position. It makes it look as though he is, again, undermining Parliament. Um, and uh, he, he's furious with, uh, with Henry. Uh, he's persuaded, not by the king, I should add, but to write a letter apologising. And he does this. And of course, this is music to the ears of Parliament because it absolutely proves that there was a plot and, and implies that the king was implicated. So it makes things 10 times worse. So Henry experiences uh, some rejection at that stage um, from, from the royalist quarter. Um, he, um, he redeems himself in the eyes of King Charles I basically by um, some, some fairly loyal uh, action as, as a soldier. Um, and uh, at the Battle of Caprini Bridge uh, plays a particular role in 1644. Um, and again, at the behest of Henrietta Maria, is actually promoted to become General of the Ordnance, uh, the artillery in the Royal Army. Uh, the picture of Charles that you have on the screen at the moment uh, is one painted by Peter Lely, actually at Zion, uh, when Charles was visiting his children then. I'll say a little bit more about that later on. But just reflecting on Charles, I think it's just worth remembering that, of course, Charles himself was the spare. He wasn't the heir. 
his uh, elder brother, uh, Prince Henry, uh, was a very promising young man, and many people thought that he would make an excellent king. Um, uh, very charismatic, uh, highly intelligent, and very pragmatic. Um, sadly, he dies from typhoid at the age of 18, and Charles, his younger brother, then becomes Prince of Wales and heir to the throne. And Charles, of course, is, is much less suited to this. Um, poor old Charles, he's had problems with his legs, he's had rickets, and, and essentially has orthopedic boots and nails. So he also had a terrible stutter, and his father had tried to cure this by making him wear a, a lead brace in his mouth, which had actually made it a lot worse. Um, and at moments of stress, he would stutter very badly. Um, I think one could say Charles would probably make a great academic uh, in a university setting, but probably wasn't the best candidate to be king. And yet he ends up in this situation when there is a crisis in the country. Um, and instead of being able to handle that, he, in effect, I would say, compounds it and makes the civil war situation even more problematic. So here is um, Henry Percy showing off his valour at Caprini Bridge in 1644. Um, and so this is probably the high point of, of his, his military career and supporting the Royalists uh, during the Civil War. Um, he then goes to France and, uh, as I say, becomes Chamberlain of Henrietta Maria's household, the royal household there. And sadly, he dies uh, before the... Um, Charles II becomes uh, a king. He dies in 1659, so he dies quite young. Um, and people are relatively kind to, to, to his memory by saying that he, he, he was loyal. But as I say, he was inept in his handling of a number of situations, and particularly the, um, the army plots to release uh, Stafford from the Tower uh, paid very badly against the king at a time when he needed to build credibility, not lose it. So we move on to the third and most, I, I think, powerful and important of the siblings, and this is Algernon Percy, 10th Earl of Northumberland, painted here by um, Van Dyke, um, and essentially, and again, this is in the collection of the Duke, here he's shown as uh, Admiral of the Fleet. So he is made uh, Admiral of the Fleet, and uh, I think you can tell that by the huge anchor that's next to him and the ships firing away in the background and his commander's pat on. But um, Algernon moves into royal circles. He's expected to be a royalist. He's expected to support the king. But in essence, he doesn't start off that way. Um, his father has educated him as a Protestant, certainly, but, but he's wanted him to be a humanist. And he's given him a very broad education. Uh, he's sent for six years on a tour of Europe, a grand tour, as it was in the 17th century. And he spends time in uh, France, in Holland, um, uh, in Italy. Uh, and when he comes back in 1624, um, I should say he studied at Cambridge University and he um, uh, was also qualified as, as, as a lawyer. Um, so he had a, a, a rich intellectual um, uh, background. Uh, he becomes MP initially um, uh, uh, in, in Sussex and then in Chichester um, before he's called to the House of, House of Lords. And he's critical of the king's policies. Um, so unusually, he's speaking out against the king uh, um, and uh, is seen as someone who is being uh, not an ardent parliamentarian, but someone who does argue for constitutional monarchy rather than the king's rather arbitrary actions. I mean, particularly his period, 10 year period of, of uh, rule when he broke, broke parliament and essentially rules on his own. Um, he's forced back to call Parliament because he can only raise money through Parliament, and essentially that is that's what promotes uh, you know the, the great conflict that finally fires off in in 1642. Just quickly going back to Zion, this is the house as it would have been during the Civil War period, um, and you can see uh, the, the the wings. We think this was probably as a Tudor house built in the 1500s, a, a double courtyard house, and uh, the first courtyard that you can see here in the, in the red brick. Uh, is the sort of um, the service area. Um, remembering that the far side of the house, which faces the river, was the front of the house, and you approached it from that side. This is the rear of the house where the sort of the ancillary buildings were. Uh, but it gives you some idea of the house as, uh, as, as it would have been when Algernon was living here and during the Civil War period. And this is a slightly later picture, again, the 17th century, but I've chosen it because it shows how close the house is to the River Thames, as you can see flowing around here, and you can see the gardens. Now, this is this is important when we come to basically the, the Battle of Brentford and the way in which the house is caught up in that, and the way Algernon and his family are caught up in all of that as well. Um, 
So just to, to position it, so bear that in mind when I tell you that the parliamentarians bombard the house from uh, small ships on the river and do quite a lot of damage to the external walls. And we have in the archives up at Annick all of the details of the costs of repairs and everything else that took place there. This is Percy at his height, because Charles is so desperate to win him over that he makes him a, a number of serious and, and very prominent appointments. Admiral of the fleet initially, which we've referred to, and you've seen the portrait of him with the anchor and the boats in the background, um, and then Lord High Admiral, with the view that he will be Lord High Admiral until such time as Charles' second son, James, is old enough to take on that role. Um, but this is absolutely uh, the pinnacle of, of overall charge of the Navy, of the ships at that time. Um, this showing Percy on um, the military side, the, 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 the um, if you like, as commander of uh, the armies, he's initially appointed as army uh, commander of the armies in England south of the Trent, and then he's made commander of the armies north. And he's asked to lead the expedition into Scotland to enforce um, Archbishop Lord's common prayer book re reforms and, and the support for the bishops. Now, Percy, Algernon and Percy, is ex knowing the Scots full well, is extremely concerned about this. He thinks this is the wrong policy. Um, he knows that uh, Scotland, which is strongly uh, Presbyterian, is not going to accept either of these things. And he knows that, uh, in fact, the army that's being put together is not going to be very effective. Uh, it's virtually a scratch-built army, whereas many of the Scots have military experience because many Scots had served on the continent and the armies of Gustavus Adolphus um, in Sweden, great Protestant uh, leader there. And so there's a lot more military experience in the Scottish ranks than there is in the English ranks. The picture is interesting, however, because it shows not only Percy in heroic form as leader and commander of the army, but the army laid out behind. And you can see the formations with what they call pike and shot. Shot being the musketeers, pike holding the 16-foot pikes. You can see them in the blocks there. I'll say a little bit more about that in a second or two. Uh, but uh, what basically happens is that um, uh, when the time comes for the army to march into Scotland, um, Percy is ill. Uh, genuinely ill we think but extremely helpfully ill because he's unable to lead the army and his second in command stafford um is it takes takes command moves up and of course the english army is soundly defeated the scots move down they occupy not only the thumberland but durham and they refuse to move from the north of england until they're paid and they're 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 ch being charging basically uh, the king eight hundred and sixty pound a day. Uh, so he has to call Parliament again to get the agreement for finance to get the Scots out of the country. And in calling that Parliament, that precipitates the the, the crisis that I referred to before uh, and the breakdown in relationships and the move to war. I just very quickly wanted to talk a little about the armies of the time. Remember, these are scratch armies. Uh, there are no standing troops, basically, apart from small guards uh, in sovereign's control and small groups in the coastal fortresses. So the people who form the armies are, have very little uh, experience in England in any case. Um, you get apprentices from the towns, and that disrupts the uh, economic pace of uh, production in the towns. You get uh, agricultural workers from the countryside, which disrupts agricultural production and food supplies. Um, a lot of youngsters are quite excited, a bit, I guess, like it was in the, in the call-up for the First World War, when everyone was anxious to have a bit of an adventure before it all finished, because everyone thought it would be over very quickly. Uh, and, of course, that isn't the case. As I say, we went on for 11 years of bitter warfare and um, some terrible things that happened during that. Uh, so the troops are basically scratch, and they only build, build up their experience through the fighting as it proceeds. Very quickly, there's also a bit of a myth that, um, you know, the Cavaliers all wore floppy hats and had long hair and uh, parliamentarians all had cropped hair and so on and so forth. I'm afraid it's not true. Um, very difficult to recognise troops on either side because there are no standard uniforms. Um, and uh, the cavalry men you see here, these are royalists wearing the red sash. The parliamentarians would have looked exactly the same. Uh, the artillery again, the artillery master gunner in the front here is a professional soldier who would be hiding, quite often mercenaries come from Europe. Um, but most of the gunners essentially are just agricultural laborers who have brought in and are told what to do by the gunner. And very quickly, the foot, as I said, pike and shot, 16 foot long pikes, which were used to hold off cavalry. 
and to protect the, the, the musketeers. You see a musketeer in the background there and um, holding a, a musket, a black powder musket, and no uniforms. These troops here, um, each colonel would levy uh, a, a regiment, raise up to a thousand men, and equip it and pay for it. So on the left, you can see three of the units, which in fact were, um, were, were fighting here at Brentford. John Hampton's green coats, Lord Brooks' purple coats, and um, Denzel Hollis's red coats, essentially. And on the other side, you can see some royalist uh, uh, units. They're all parliamentarian. Uh, you've got basically yellow coats, green coats, and blue coats. So you can see similar coats across across the armies. They had to wear field signs. Um, very confusing. Um, and initial battles quite quite a quite a quite a quite a problem really. We move very quickly on to the battle at Brentford and Zion House and the, where it was all caught up. Um, the first major battle of the Civil War takes place in 1642 at Edge Hill, and uh, it's it's a draw between the two sides. It's it's a deep shock to both sides. Casualties are quite high, and many many people basically desert because they're just horrified by the nature of the warfare. Um, but what happens is that the king has the advantage over um, the parliamentarian army because he's got around it and is nearer to London. And so he can march on London. And the parliamentarian army has to march round very quickly to get back to try and support London. There is a fear that the king will move in and occupy London. As I was saying earlier, London is so important that if the king were able to capture London, that would be a major blow for the parliamentarian cause. Um, so. What you've got on the map here, you can see the Blue River, the Thames, you can see Brentford, and Zion House is just near Brentford. Uh, the King's Army approached us from Edge Hill. Um, they're on the way, they've captured Banbury, they've captured Oxford, and they've captured Reading, uh, and the army forms up at Colnebrook. Um, there's a panic in London, an absolute panic. People think that, uh, that the London's going to be invaded, the King will, will come back, and there's a desire to try and negotiate a rapid peace. Now, Algernon Percy uh, is, is one of the people who leads the Peace Commission. So he's on a horse galloping from London out to Colnebrook to talk to the king. The king indicates that he's willing to consider a peaceful settlement. So negotiations start and orders go out to the troops um, that, in fact, they can stand down for the time being because there won't be any fighting because essentially there are negotiations for peace. And the parliamentarians have sent troops to occupy Brentford um, to defend it and to defend Kingston. And the reason that, that is Kingston has one of the two bridges across the River Thames. The other is the uh, uh, London Bridge in central London. So Kingston's important to hold. The Royalists are approaching from um, Oxford and, and at Colnebrook, and the strategic way forward would be straight down through Brentford and into central London. Percy, Algernon Percy, I say riding backwards and forwards, negotiations underway for the king uh, to set a peace, and it looks like there could be some sort of agreement between Parliament and the king. What the king actually does is to instruct uh, the Royalist army to move forward and to take Brentford and to move on to London. So while the negotiations are going on, while it's been said that the, uh, the, the troops can stand down, many of the senior officers and the parliamentarian troops that are in Brentford have, have gone home for the weekend. Um, and essentially, the, the troops have only a small number of, of officers with them. Uh, the Royalists attack. Uh, the Royalist attack is led by the Earl of Forth, who's an elderly and experienced Scotsman, um, but the actual attack on Brentford is led by Prince Rupert, who is the commander of the horse. Now, uh, Rupert is uh, a great character from the Civil War period, um, the, the son of the sister of, of Charles, um, Elizabeth, who married the Elector of Bohemia, uh, and he had actually got experience of fighting uh, in the Thirty Years' War in, in Europe. So he's one of the few commanders that Charles had who had serious uh, military experience. But there's a bit of a problem with that too, and we'll see what happened. So we've got through a romantic picture of Rupert and a nice woodcut too, um, but he is, the, he is the royalist general who is going to be attacking Brentford uh, uh, and, and, and Zion House as it happens. And just to remind you about Brentford. Um, Brentford in this map, this is Moses Glover's map of 1635, which extends right the way across um, uh, to Windsor, in fact. This is just a small uh, detail, but it shows Brentford, the town of Brentford, made up of three areas. Um, you've got Old Brentford, which is nearest to us, New Brentford in the middle, and the bridge across the River Brent, and then 
Brentford End, which leads up. You can see Zion House on the left with its gardens around it. And to the right on that road, you can see Richard Wynne's house. Now, the parliamentarian troops that come in, the three regiments I told you about, Denzel Hollis's, John Hampton's, and um, uh, John Hampton's regiment is held back further back, but uh, Denzel Hollis's red coats and Peter, uh, Lord Brooks' purple coats come in and take up positions, build barricades across the bridge, in the centre of the town, and send troops forward to Wynne's house. And on the 11th of November, Prince, uh, the, Prince Rupert attacks with his cavalry down the main road and attacks Wynne's house. They're surprised um, and are forced back by the parliamentarians initially, and the, the, and the small force that's there, parliamentarian force, falls back to the bridge. And there's a rather, uh, well, atmospheric, but not necessarily very accurate picture of the Battle of Brentford, uh, which was commissioned in the 1930s by the then MP for Chiswick. Um, uh, but it does show the barricade across the bridge and uh, and the, and the, and the, and the cavalry attacking. It's actually the uh, Royalist infantry that do finally break through the barricade and 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 march into Brentford. Um, uh, I, I just say that Brentford is not an insignificant village. Uh, it is the largest urban settlement between London and Windsor, had a population of only about 1,500, but it's a, an affluent place, and many of the houses are brick-built, uh, not dissimilar to the Dutch Merchant's House, which now is, is Kew Palace, um, across in, uh, in Kew Gardens. So houses like that, quite substantial houses, and uh, it shows why the house-to-house -house fighting that took place in the town took some time, because they're quite robust buildings that, uh, that, that could stay and the, uh, the musket and, 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 and cannon fire. The consequence of the Battle of Brentford is that um, the parliamentarians are defeated. Uh, some 500 prisoners are taken and uh, colours and, and cannon are taken. Um, and in London itself, uh, there is a complete and complete panic. Um, the train bands, together with many volunteers, march out to obstruct the royalist army and the next day uh, at turnham green the 14,000 royalists are faced by some 26,000 parliamentarians although many of the troops on the parliamentarian side are very raw and inexperienced nevertheless the numbers count uh, and what basically happens is there's a little bit of probing a little bit of exchange of fire but there is no battle at turnham green the king i think recognizes he's definitely outnumbered and he withdraws back to oxford which is where he makes his headquarters interestingly he's not to come back to london central london until 1649 as his trial and, uh, and his execution um what does happen in london however as a consequence of the battle of brentford is that these uh, defenses are built around london um they cost uh, uh, something like six thousand nine hundred pounds, seven thousand pounds. Doesn't sound a lot in today's money, but at the time was phenomenal. Um, and they are a mixture of the forts you can see, um, the sconces and forts, and the walls, the ramparts. Most of these are earthen ramparts reinforced with timber, but some are masonry. Uh, and there's some twelve miles of it. And at the time, this was one of the largest fortified uh, or fortifications that had been undertaken in Europe. So quite significant, built effectively by, um, well, I say voluntary, but by, by impressed labour. Uh, all of the guilds in the city had to take a turn uh, at a particular day when they went out to work. It's estimated that some 100,000 uh, London citizens took part in the building of of the walls, um, and uh, that gave some security to London. Of course, London was never threatened again after this battle at the Brentford, uh, but it was a deep shock um, to to London and to the parliamentarian uh, cause and to their psyche. What happens uh, at this stage is that the, the children of Charles I are um, brought to Zion, um, and uh, Algernon is asked to look after them. Now, this picture is the five eldest children of Charles I. It's not these children necessarily here. So the, the boy in pink with a large dog is the future Charles II. Uh, to his right and our left is Mary, their eldest uh, uh, daughter, uh, who will, of course, marry William of, of Orange, and um, they are the parents of William, who will become William the uh, Third, again another William of Orange. Uh, in between Charles and uh, Mary is James the um, Second, uh, or James, who will become King James the Second. And to the right, you have uh, Princess Elizabeth and Princess Anne. Um, as I said, there are nine children, or two die in in, uh, in infancy, and um, there are two yet to uh, to appear on the, in the painting. But 
This is quite interesting because this is a famous Van Dyke painting which hangs at Windsor Castle, very, very popular and, and copied many, many times. Um, and Zion has one of these, uh, interestingly given by Charles II to Algernon Percy at the time of the restoration as a thank you for looking after the children. Um, but the interesting thing is that uh, Charles I, who has now become a prisoner of Parliament, uh, negotiations still going on about a settlement, and Charles still playing the long game um, uh, while negotiating, uh, writing to the Scots to try and get military support from Scotland, writing to the Irish to try and get military support from Ireland, writing to Wales. So essentially, um, many people would say bad faith and duplicity. Um, he would say uh, sensible movement and, and tactics, I'm sure. Uh, but it's, it's, it undermines confidence in Charles and leads to a great deal of frustration. Uh, in the picture, uh, which was actually painted at, at uh, Zion by Peter Lely, um, you can see Charles and his son James, uh, and um, he's just signed a declaration uh, promising not to run away again because he's, all the time that he's held, James has, has tried to run away, he's been caught and brought back. And Algernon is extremely embarrassed by this and asked the king to secure a, a commitment that the boy won't. Um, in practice, James does get away and he goes to Holland and uh, joins his, his brother uh, over there. Uh, now, Algernon has actually uh, been leader of the peace party within uh, the parliamentary cause. So he's a parliamentarian, the most senior member of Charles's cabinet who moved to the parliamentarian side and some people would have said that was um, a cynical betrayal um, others would say that he was acting out of integrity uh, and, and his beliefs um, but he becomes very involved with both Fairfax and Cromwell and is a great supporter of the move towards the creation of what's called the new model army um, as I said all of the troops up until then had been amateurs and uh, they've been raised on a regional basis and the Civil War had shown that this was not an effective way to fight, um, and that what was needed was a national army and a high level of professionalism within it. And the New Metal Army did two things. Um, it, 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 firstly, through Parliament, um, they introduced a self-denying ordinance, which meant that all of those people who held rank in the military but did so through social grounds uh, should stand down because only men with experience and who prove military benefit um, uh, experience should actually hold uh, officers' roles. Um, Cromwell was, was made an exception there because uh, although he had no great military experience, he had definitely shown huge talent as a commander of cavalry and um, he became the, uh, the, the, the cavalry general in the movement. Um, his famous Ironsides, his disciplined Ironsides raised uh, in, in East Anglia, um, being uh, you know, an example of, of his, his experience and his merit. Um, and uh, Cromwell, uh, as I say, Percy becomes involved in, in, in moving forward the reforms, the army reforms, and several meetings are held at Zion House uh, with Cromwell and Fairfax coming here. Um, and, and you've got those linkages uh, with Percy playing a, say, an important role in, in an instrument because it is the defeat of the Royalist Army at the Battle of Naseby in 1645 that really lays the end uh, for the Royalist cause. Although there are further risings, essentially um, they've lost the military uh, capability um, and the king is then desperately, as I say, trying to uh, get support from elsewhere while still negotiating for peace. Percy himself, he negotiates for the king on three occasions, 1643 on behalf of Parliament, 1648 uh, on behalf of Parliament, and as I said earlier, and 1642, um, and on each occasion uh, the king plays him along but does not actually uh, make any acceptance of a constitutional framework uh, for a king who is not uh, autocratic and, and a man who believes profoundly in, in the divine rights of kings, Charles keeps that belief to, to the end essentially. So we move really to the end game. Um, basically, Charles is arraigned as uh, that man of blood and tried for treason. And while many people argued that this was not legally possible, as king he couldn't be brought before his, his peers and, and, um, and tried, others said, no, you know, no man stands above the law. This is very much part of the uh, parliamentary argument. Uh, and, and Charles is uh, in 1649, uh, January, 
after a, a trial in which he, he, he behaves with great dignity in that trial. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the sort of result, I think, is pretty much uh, foregone. He is um, condemned to death and is executed uh, outside the banqueting house in, in Whitehall. And of course, what then happens is that um, Britain becomes a Commonwealth and a Republic. So in this slide, you've got the execution of Charles I. And um, you can see here that the, the scene uh, uh, which caused great horror at the time. Um, uh, well, I guess some people were, were, were felt it was the right thing to do. Um, and there's the story that uh, that Cromwell visits Charles's body and uh, and says such cruel necessity. Um, but it's, there's no question that many parliamentarians felt that Charles had basically uh, played a double game and had been very duplicitous and was responsible for the suffering that many people had faced across the country. Uh, 1660, we moved to the Restoration. So I've glossed over the Republic and the Commonwealth period. Um, but during that period, uh, Percy, uh, although Cromwell and uh, his son Richard try to get him to be involved at a national level in politics, uh, he is appalled by the execution of the king. He's led the opposition in the House of Lords to the execution, and he, he basically steps right back from politics. Um, as I say, uh, Lucy Percy uh, herself has also stepped back from politics, and she, she sadly dies in 1660, just before um, Charles II is restored as, as king. Um, and uh, and it's at that stage, if we pick up in 1660, which which way will Charles II regard uh, the Percy family? Well, he looks he looks at the service that Henry had provided. Henry, as I say, having died in 1659, and he, he regards him as having been, on the whole, a, a loyal royalist. Um, Lucy has also now sadly died, and and I think that um, she also is is largely forgiven for the role she played, and uh, is lauded really for for her her, her, her sort of strong profile um, uh, within within court politics. Um, and Algernon himself, well, he is basically uh, made uh, Lord High Constable of of uh, of England in 1661, um, and. Uh, and welcome to the, the Privy Council. Um, so he is welcomed back uh, to uh, the, 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 his royalist uh, roots and his, his uh, support for, for the king. Charles II does have a, have a little bit of a joke at his expense because uh, during the course of the Civil War, King Charles' great picture collection, he was a great uh, uh, connoisseur of the arts, was sold off. Now, it wasn't sold off willfully. It was sold off because the king had major debts and after his execution, he's had to be paid. So the pictures were all sold off. Many people took the opportunity to buy um, masterpieces at a very low rate. When Charles II is restored, he basically says, right, I shall overlook the fact that people did this and just make sure the pictures come back, please. Um, and he looks around for someone to lead the work on this, and he alights on Algeron and says, Algeron, perhaps you could take the lead on this, knowing full well that Algeron himself has several pictures from the Royal Collection and um, is expected to give those back as a, a key example. So, just to say, uh, that's the end of my talk. I hope you found it of some interest and that you've seen the colourful personalities that at Zion played significant roles in the Civil War in a variety of ways. Oh, and I should just say, please, if you're interested in seeing some of those paintings in the flesh, do come and visit Zion. Uh, we, we've got in the red drawing room here a fantastic collection of, um, of Stuart uh, period art uh, and, and well worth seeing. And then when, of course, you've got the grounds and the gardens as well. So you can walk through history uh, and we're open from the 20th of March until the end of October. Uh, you can see five days a week uh, or three days for the house. Thank you. We have some uh, information there about how to visit Sion, and it's it really is worth a visit, especially if Howard is one of on one of his days of of, of guiding you around. I can guarantee that you'll have a wonderful time. And I think we can have the next slide, which will tell us a bit more about what's coming up in the rest of our series. Now, in a, a slight change from our normal uh, procedure, uh, next month on the seventh of March. Pope's Grotto is going to present an actual performance by Georgina Locke. I've seen Georgina do this one-woman show before. She's written a one-woman show about a good friend, an actual frenemy of Alexander Pope, Lady Mary Workley Montagu. So do come to that. That one is only going to be available live online. We won't be able to put that um, on YouTube. So if you want to see Georgina 
as Lady Mary Wortley Montague, then you have to um, log on to Zoom on the 7th of March. So that's um, Georgina on the 7th of March. And then after that, you'll notice that we've got a bit of a gap. The next talk is on the 6th of June, and it'll be the first presentation from one of our new luminaries, the William Morris Society. And in April, we um, have a break, but in, um, in May, uh, we're having the first of our London Luminaries live events, live and in person, with a number of our favourite speakers and, and colleagues will be um, doing a, a, a presentation, like a little literary festival, from Pittshanger Manor in Ealing. And there'll be an opportunity to visit Pittshanger and then to have a, a, a panel discussion and then to have a drink and to meet the luminaries and to have a good old chat with us, which would be, be quite wonderful.